And good evening once again. Welcome. Uh, whoa, boy, what a beautiful uh, uh, opportunity to come together on this uh, dreary day. Lord, I just pray that, uh, that you would just bless those that have come out tonight, that you would bless those that might see this tonight. Um, welcome. Um, it's another Wednesday evening and the Word on Wednesdays. An opportunity to just get together and to open God's Word and to study God's Word and to hear from God. And so, if you've been with us before, you know that we're in the book of Numbers right now. We're going to continue that study tonight. And uh, But before we get started in that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your Word. We thank you so much for the opportunity to open your word freely and to study it and to, to discuss it and learn from it. We pray, Lord, that you would join us here tonight, that you would speak directly to us. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, as you direct and you guide, Lord, so that we might draw closer to you with a better understanding. Lord, mold us and shape us through your word. And so I pray, Lord, that you not only speak directly to us here tonight, but to all those that might be watching online as well. You know the needs and you know, uh, Lord, what they need to hear. And so we just pray, Lord, uh, that that would, that would be the case tonight. And again, we thank you. Just ask you to join us right here, right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So... Boy, this has been quite a journey, right, with the Israelites. Um, they, they finally started moving just a few weeks ago we, in our study there in Numbers. They've started moving. Uh, they left Mount Sinai. They've journeyed now, and they journeyed all the way up to the edge of the promised land, right? And they got to the edge of the promised land, and instead of just going in and taking it, they, they kind of held back, and they said, well, let's go in and spy it out first. Let's go take a look at it first. And so they spy it out and they come back with this report. And the report was kind of mixed message. It was twofold. At first it was, yes, this is a beautiful land. It's bountiful. It's just as God had said. However, and there was that word, however, we looked at last week. However, in spite of all of that, they're just too, too many people. The cities are too fortified. They're giants in the land. We can't take it. We don't have the capability, is what they said. And they completely rejected God's promise. They completely forgot about God's promise, what He said. And instead of relying on Him, they relied on their own abilities. And this report they got back from the land and they refuse to enter the land. Even after we saw at the end of last week, Joshua and Caleb, and we saw Caleb, they, they pleaded with them. Do not, do not forsake God. Do not rebel against God. Let's just go take it. They were the only two. But everyone else said, no, we can't do it. And so upon that rejection, God shows up again, and He shows up, He appears, it says. He appears at the tabernacle in all His glory. And we saw at the end of that, th this picture of their actions and how they do not reflect God's glory, but God shows up in all His glory anyway. And now God's going to answer. He's going to speak with Moses again. And that's where we're going to pick up tonight. They have just rejected his plan, they have they've said, we're not going in. As a matter of fact, they had begged, they had said, let's choose a whole new leader. They've not only rejected his plan to go into the promised land, they're rejecting Moses at this point and Aaron. They, they want to choose a new leader and go home. They want to choose a new leader and go home. And God comes and he appears in all his glory. And that's where we left off. And tonight we're going to pick up in verse 11 there in chapter 14 where he's going to now speak to Moses. And he's going to address this rejection by his people. And so let's get into the study tonight. Let's, let's look at that. If you have your Bibles, get them open. And uh, we'll be in Numbers chapter 14, 
beginning in verse 11. And then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. So God speaks to Moses now, and he, and he, he basically says, Moses, how long? How long are they going to continue to reject me? They've been rejecting him all along, every step of the way. As soon as the least little bit of adversity comes their way, they reject him. Then he shows them some miraculous sign, and then they, they're all of a sudden they're on God's side again. And then as soon as a little adversity comes their way, they reject him. And he says, Moses, how long? He's speaking to Moses. He's speaking to Moses directly. Even though it says in verse 10, just before we started this verse, that he appeared before all the children of Israel. They all see all his glory and see him there. But he speaks directly to Moses. Which is interesting to me because Moses hears his voice, but they do not. And that's true with many when we're, oftentimes when the children of God are in rebellion against him, we wonder why we don't hear his voice. We don't hear his voice because we're in rebellion. Right? We're, we're, we reject what he has to say. We've already rejected him. But God asked Moses, how long? It made no sense. Their rejection of him really made no sense after everything they've seen that he's brought them through. And so it's a, it's a good question for God to ask. And so he says, they're gonna, there's going to be judgment. There has to be judgment. And so he puts them under this judgment. He says, I will strike them. I will disinherit them. He's, he's upset. He's so mad at this point. Mad. He's, he's angry with the children that he selected to be his representative, to be his children. And he says, I'm going to give you, you rebellious Israelites, I'm going to give you just what you asked for in judgment. Remember what they had asked for just a few verses earlier in this chapter? To die in the wilderness. It would have been better if we just died in the wilderness. And here he says, I'm, I'll disinherit them. He tells Moses directly, he says, I will make of you a nation greater and mightier. He basically gives Moses an offer. He says, I'm going to disinherit them. And I'm going to start over with you, Moses, and your descendants. And I'll give you a nation greater and mightier. That's an astonishing offer for Moses, right? I'm going to fulfill my promise and my promises of land, the promises of a nation, the promises, all of these things, these promises that I made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm going to now fulfill them through you, Moses, if they won't do it. Instead of going through the 12 tribes, I'll make a nation out of you, Moses. What, a, what an offer, right? You will now become the patriarch. Interesting offer. And we, we have to take that as a genuine proposal from God. He said it. He, he don't often give us make-believe words, right? And I believe if Moses had done nothing, he probably would have done, he would have done it. But Moses does do something. And, this is, and, and we know that God caused Moses' heart to be the way it was. And we know that it was God all along and it's all part of his plan. But I love the way Moses answers. Verse 13, And Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it. For by your might you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among these people, that you, Lord, 
are seen face to face and your cloud stands above them and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if you kill these people as one man, then the nations will have heard of your fame and will speak saying, because the Lord was not able to bring his people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. In other words, Moses appeals to God's own character. And what kind of example and message that would send to others and to the rest of the world. He doesn't even consider God's proposal. He flat out rejects God's proposal to make a nation out of him. Right? Adam Clark would write this about Moses' prayer. It's full of simplicity and energy, and he argues with God and reasons with him in a very respectful way about how he would show the heart of full of humanity and that evidence um, of God would be deepened if he stuck to his plan, right? Moses asked God to spare the nation. If God promised you the world in this type of notoriety, would you give it up? It took a humble heart. It took someone who was had a heart like God's, a heart for God, to recognize that God had already made these promises and God, His reputation would be damaged if he didn't follow through. And so he asked God to spare the nation for his own glory, for God's glory, so that his reputation would be intact. And that's a humble heart that that just wants to submit. Because it's not about Moses. It's not about you or I. It's about God and him and his glory. And he knew that if he did this, if he, if he disinherited and killed all these people that he took out of Egypt and started over, that all the other nations would hear of it and that all of it, and the word would be, well, he wasn't able to do what he said he could do. He wasn't able to bring them to the promised land. And so he begs God, don't do it, Lord. Don't give in. Be true to your work. And he intercedes on behalf of Israel. And then he prays this prayer, verse 17. And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of his fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people. I pray according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Moses prays and he prays and he glorifies God and he prays in his, the glories and the power of God and he asks Because of your mercy, because of your long-suffering, Lord, forgive these rebellious people, just as you have spoken. It's almost a direct quote from the words of self-revelation that God had spoken to Moses back in Exodus chapter 34. And then he reminds him of who he is from that chapter in Exodus. He's long-suffering. He's abundant. He's forgiving iniquity and transgression. By no means does he clear the guilty, but mercy. In other words, Lord, you have revealed yourself to me by your word. Your word declares who you are. And now, Lord, I pray you act toward Israel the way you have declared yourself to me. That's having a heart that's in tune with and being directed and guided by God. 
a heart with God for His glory. And He knew the power of prayer and He knew the power of having a humble heart with God and He knew that if He appealed to God that God would answer. It's a, it's a wonderful example of intercession. How we are to intercede in prayer for those around us. It's all to be based on God's own word, on God's revelation, on who God is and His character. And it speaks to Moses' heart. Lord, no, I don't want a new nation under my name. Because that would take away from your glory. I want your glory to reign. That is his prayer and his heart. And so God answers him in verse 20. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. A very short answer. The heart of Moses in this intercession, right? It was successful. And these are the sweet words that he hears. According to your word. It means Moses' prayer mattered. God heard it. God listened. And God answered. You see, when we pray with the same heart of God, He hears it. And He answers. Moses prayed out of humility. And he, and he prayed, basically, this, this is a prayer of life and death for these people. Heaven or hell. And it's the same oftentimes for us in our prayers. A lot hangs in the balance. A lot of people will find this passage difficult. You know, they think that it appears God's angry with His people and then Moses changes His mind. That Moses gives him these logical reasons for not doing what he said he's going to do and he changes his mind. And, and that's one way to look at it, right? God is initially acting out of some passion or some anger in his heart, but then Moses reminds him who he is. But here's what's important to remember. This prayer of Moses was inspired by God to begin with because his heart was with God. God is all almighty and all sufficient. God knew Moses' heart and God knew Moses would intercede all along. And this just really, 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 boy, I can speak today, really shows the heart of God. Because Moses' heart is just a reflection of God's heart. God did demand justice. His people had rejected him, right? And, and they, had, they were being destroyed because of their, re, their rejection, because of their rebellion. But he also had a heart of love and mercy and grace, and he knew Moses' heart. And so Moses was his servant that interceded on their behalf, and he listened. And he pardoned according to your word. But really that's what he wanted all along. It's just like with us. We've all rebelled. We've all rejected at some point. Sin in the world separates us from God. There must be justice. He cannot just forgive the, the, the rebellion. He cannot just forgive the sin without there being a penalty paid. But he can look at you and I and he can pardon because of the intercession, because the penalty was paid by Jesus Christ. What a beautiful picture. Chuck Smith he put it this way, our prayers don't really change God, but he chooses to use our prayers as the vehicle by which to pour out his grace and his love on us. 
And so, just because he doesn't wipe them out instantly and make a new mo uh, nation, they still must suffer a punishment. And that's what we're going to see next. Look at verse 21. But truly, as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers. Nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. And now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow, turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. So his response is to answer Moses and say, okay, I'll spare them, I'll pardon them, but there's still going to be some punishment. And a punishment here um, is that they're not going to enter. They're not going to be allowed now to enter the promised land. They've behaved so intolerably. I won't put them to death, but neither can things go back to the way they were. You can't just go back to normal, right? The day before the rebellion happened. Allen put it this way in his commentary, the words of God in verse 21 are forceful and direct. As surely as he lives, as surely as his glory fills the earth, there is a sentence to be paid. So he had consistently put him, he says in that passage, they had consistently put him to the test. So in other words, he's not only reacting to this particular rebellion, he's reacting now Remember at the very beginning tonight, we, his first question to Moses is, how long will they continue to reject me? He's gotten to the point where they've continuously rejected him over a long period of time. They've had this consistent reaction to God, this consistency in their rejection. And it's because of that that we see here, he says, they certainly shall not see the land which I swore to their fathers. Those who had continuously put God to the test and tested his resolve and rebelled against his promises will not see the promised land, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua. Why? Because Caleb had a different spirit in him. Caleb had followed him fully. Caleb was one that said, let's go now because God said, and I trust I believe, I have faith in God. I will bring Caleb into the land, God says. They stood on the side of faith when everyone else stood on the side of what they could see in their circumstances around them in the world. Caleb literally followed completely, fully, after God and his promises. And eventually he will receive a great and appropriate reward. Ultimately he ends up being granted a tract of land in the tribal allocation for the Judaites in the region of Hebron. And, and he, he gets his reward in the promised land. But for now, as a nation, they are to turn. They are to turn and move out into the wilderness. God had brought them to the threshold. He had brought them right up to the edge of the land. And all they had to do was immediately go in and take it. Instead, they hesitated. They said, well, let's go check it out first. Let's go spy it out. They go in and spy it out. They come back with this mixed report. Yeah, it's great land. Oh, but we can't take it. And that rebellion, that rejection of God's promise was just the final rejection for him, rebellion after all of this time that they had continuously, over 10 times they had tested him, he says, and he had demonstrated his faithfulness to them and they continued to test him and test him. And he says, y'all aren't going to see it. Now you need to go back into the wilderness and they're not going to be allowed to enter the promised land. They had demonstrated that they had not been fully transformed into promised land people. They were still slave-minded people. 
and it's going to take more wilderness training to grow them in the next generation. And it'll be the next generation, the new generation, that will be the people that will come into the promised land. And look at verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints with the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered, according to your entire number, from twenty years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years, and you shall know my rejection. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Wow. He gave this message to the nation. This generation must die in the wilderness. You're not going to get a new leader. You're not going to go back to Egypt. You're going to die in this wilderness. You will never see the promised land. Basically, God's saying, if you didn't want it, when I offered it to you, then you don't get it and you'll never get to have it. And they remember back at the very beginning of this chapter, towards the end of last week's message, they had basically said, if only we had died in this wilderness, and God's now going to give them their desire. You are going to die in this wilderness. They preferred death to a walk of faith with God into their destination. Except for Caleb and Joshua, these two men of great faith, because they exercised their faith. They will be allowed to enter the promised land because they had hearts of new men. They had been changed. Notice it's just those two. Not even Moses and Aaron were accepted. Except Joshua and Caleb. Now there's going to be their own reasons why they won't be allowed to enter as well. Even Moses wasn't guiltless in this whole issue that had just happened. He was the one that agreed to the request of the people to go in and spy out the land to begin with. Instead of just taking it by faith. He was the leader. He should have said, no, we're going in. So who will get to enter the promised land? Your little ones. You see, anyone 20 years old and older at this point is going to die in the wilderness over the next 40 years. Only those 19 and younger, except Joshua and Caleb, are going to grow up now and become the next generation over 40 years, and they're going to get to enter the land. And it's an ironic twist because they had tried to use their wives and their children as their justification for rebelling against God, saying, you brought us out here to kill our wives and our children. God says, not only did I not bring you out here to kill your children, but I'm going to give your children your inheritance now because you refused to take it. Right? He talks about their infidelity their harlotry against him, their spiritual infidelity against God. I don't know what they, what their idols were that took the place of God other than their comfort, their safety, Right? Those things that oftentimes we think we get from the world around us that we seek out. 
But they should have been focused on God and His promise all along. Whatever it was that took their focus off of God and they looked at their circumstances, they looked at the giants in the land, the fortified cities, and they said, we can't do it. And so they despised the promised land. It should have been a land to take in faith, but instead they despised it. And he says, for every day you who are spying it out, for those 40 days you're going to spend a year or 40 years now in this desert, in this wilderness. And you're going to be tested. The failure of these people to take God's promise by faith is a, is a huge turning point in Israel's history. So much so that as we see throughout many other places in the Bible, it's referred to, it's talked about. It's a historical event that was a turning point that made a huge difference in their history. It's recalled later in this book, in, of Numbers in the chapter 32. It's recalled in Deuteronomy. It's recalled in Nehemiah. It's recalled in the Psalms in a couple of places. It's recalled in Amos in a couple of places. In 1 Corinthians and in Hebrews, there are multiple places throughout the Bible where they look back on this event because it's a huge event and a turning point spiritually and physically for these people. There is a spiritual analogy that we can make here about the life of Jesus under the new covenant, right? We have this old man, the man that's still slave-minded to sin, that can never enter God's promises. The old man must die and be a promised land believer like Caleb and like Joshua in order to enter. That's what we we're called to. Psalm 95, beginning in the middle of verse 7, goes, says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. For forty years I was grieved with that generation and said it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest it's a warning to us all in the psalm God says do not be like those people we look at this historical event and we must learn the lesson that we must be people of faith and take God at His promises and at His word. Psalm 106 goes on and says, And then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe His word, but complained in their tents, and they did not heed the voice of the Lord. Therefore He raised up His hand and an oath against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their descendants among the nations, and to scatter them in the lands. Centuries later, the leaders of Israel recognized just how sinful this whole episode was. And, the, and we see this prayer in Nehemiah. But they and our fathers acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. In other words, again... All throughout history, we see them keep going back and referring to this incident, this account. They recognize that it was sinful, and they they pray and they and they plead to, Lord, don't let us be like them, don't let us have our our necks hardened and our hearts hardened. We need to heed your commands. Hebrews chapter 3 makes it clear that God had a place of rest and a promise for every believer. There's a promised land for you and I, for us to enter into, and it can only be entered into by faith. A man of unbelief 
self-reliance, focused on the world, we can never enter God's rest and abundance. We must be men of faith and trust in His promises. Because the alternative, back in our study in Numbers, the alternative, look at verse 36, Now the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation complain against him, by bringing a bad report of the land, those very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, Jephunneh, I don't know how to pronounce that, remained alive of the men who went to spy out the land. So out of the 12 men that went, out, went in to spy out the land, only those two remained alive. The other 10 were immediately killed by the plague. We're going to see the death of this unbelieving generation. It's going to take some 38 more years, a total of 40 years in the desert, right? The wilderness. They've been out there a little over a year between the first and second year. 40 years in the wilderness to kill them all off. But these 10 that started the whole thing, they die from the plague because they were unfaithful. And they took down the rest of the people with them because they convinced them. Those very men, and that's an important lesson for those who are in any kind of leadership position. Be careful where you lead people. Because you can lead people to the wrong place and in the wrong direction. Adam Clark uses this whole judgment against these unfaithful spies to warn preachers and pastors who would go out of their way to prevent people from entering God's promise and God's eternal promises. We, as teachers, are to take heed to the lessons that we learn and make sure that we're pointing people to God, the one true God, with faithful hearts, with trust. Because we see the alternative. We see the judgment that will come for those who will lead ones astray. Their sin was greater because they were in a position to lead and they had influence over all the others. And that influence, and, and now we see, just as in the past, anytime they had rebelled against God, God would come in with some miracle, show them something new, they would go back to God, and they keep flip-flopping back and forth. And now we see, because of this, because of what's happening now, the people try to change their outcome, if you will. Watch what they do in verse 39. And then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. And they rose early in the morning, and they went up to the top of the mountain, saying, Here we are, and we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. In other words, here we are. Sorry that we even uh, tried to rebel. We're ready now. We'll go. They heard about God's response. They heard about God's uh, judgment. They heard what was going to happen. Now all of a sudden they're filled with fear. They mourn. They know what's coming. And so they get up early and they hope they can undo the whole thing by saying, okay, sorry, Lord, here we are. Let's go. All of a sudden they're energetic. All of a sudden they're, they present themselves to Moses and to God and say, we're ready. Here we are. They, they now claim this commitment to go forward. We will go where the Lord has promised. For we have sinned. They even offer up a confession of sin, which is good. They recognized it was sin. The problem was, it was too late. There still had to be judgment. God had pardoned them because of Moses' prayer from, from just completely disinheriting them. But there still had to be judgment, and it's a little too late, right? This is just, and, and two, it's just an imitation of true repentance. 
And I think God saw through that. You see, they were only repentant because they'd been called out and all of a sudden they heard what the consequences were going to be. And so Moses answers these people and Moses said, Now why do you transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up, lest you be defeated by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. Moses saw there was something wrong with this superficial, uh, insincere action on their part, right? They, they, they were expressing some regret for what they had done, but they weren't truly repentant. They just wanted to do whatever they had to to not have to stay out here and die in the wilderness. It wasn't a response of any conviction on their part by the Holy Spirit. It was just a way of trying to get God to change his mind. And God and Moses tells them, God will not be with you. God, this will not succeed because he's not with you. If they'd have just gone in when they first got there, if Moses himself had directed them to just go in when they first got there, they would have been successful all the way. But now, because God will not be with them, they would not succeed. They would be defeated in a heartbeat. Cole put it this way, sometimes the consequences of sin and rebellion are irreversible. And the one must endure the experience of God's judgment before a new course of action brings blessing. And that's true even today in some of our lives. We can be forgiven our sin through the blood of Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean the consequences of our actions don't still have to be suffered here on this earth in a worldly way. And they're finding that out. But just as we often don't listen to wise counsel, we get stuck in our ways, we get this idea in our head, they don't listen either. Verse 44, But they presumed to go up to the mountaintop. Nevertheless, neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp, then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that mountain came down and they attacked them and they drove them back as far as Hormah. So they didn't listen to Moses, even when he told them, don't do it. God's not going to be with you. It will fail. They didn't listen anyway. They were stubborn. They're hard-headed. They're like, we're going to change our outcome. They're still trying to do it in their own strength. And that's what got them in the problem the first time with their rebellion because they thought they couldn't do it in their own strength. You see, if they'd have gone in the first time having faith in God, they would have been able to do it in God's strength. But now they're doing it in their own strength and it's not going to work. And Moses tells them it's not going to work, but they don't listen anyway because they're hard-headed. And I, I, I look at them and I think, man, I, I do that all the time too. Sometimes I can be just as stubborn. They had hoped to conquer Canaan, even without God's presence and his help, which obviously they didn't have because Moses refused to go with them with, and, and the Ark of the Covenant stayed in the camp with Moses. It did. So the Lord wasn't there. And this whole episode underlines this message, right? This, this whole spy story. Israel still does not take God seriously. They're not listening to Moses when they don't want to. They listen when it's convenient, when it helps them. They're not going to be able to enter Canaan. Not that generation. And even this feeble attempt fails on its own. It's a futile attempt that was made in the flesh instead of with God, and it ends in defeat. Ironically, God is with Israel, and he will stay with them, and he will raise up the next generation.
They got in their own way. How many times do you or I get in our own way? With our own feeble attempts, with our own human thoughts, with our own ways. Instead of trusting God, sometimes we think we know better. We know the way. God would have given them that land had they have gone in and taken it by faith right from the, from the very beginning. They'd have just trusted Him all along. It was theirs. Often, we fail because of our own fallen human nature. And it gets us into trouble time and time again. We have to be better than they were about surrendering and giving it over to God and trusting in Him and His promises. Choose His nature and His way over mine every time, every day, every minute because it is so much better. I pray that's what would happen for all of us that we would all learn to have greater faith and greater trust in God and His promises and His way. Especially in the world today when we look at all the circumstances and things that surround us. We're going to stop there tonight. That's the message tonight. I'm actually going to be out for the next couple of weeks. Uh, the Word on Wednesdays will continue. We're going to have um, Pastor Aaron and Pastor Jerry filling in. So please join them. We'll pick it up next week in chapter 15. We'll continue to follow the Israelites as they continue their journey now back in the wilderness. And God has a message. He has lessons for us all in it. So, so join them. Tune in again next week if you're online. And uh, I'll see you all back in a couple of weeks. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the example that we see in this picture. This event, Lord, that, that really changed the course of history for the Israelites. What a picture of trust, a picture of faith, in contrast to unbelief and distrust and looking to the world. I pray, Lord, that we would learn this lesson the easy way and not the hard way that they did. So I just want to pray for all those, Lord, that hear this message, that you would speak directly to them that which you would have them to hear. I thank you for this, these people, these men and women who faithfully come out to hear your word because they want to grow closer to you. And I pray you grow each and every one of us closer to you and grow our faith. Again, Lord, thank you. Direct our path until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.